Well, hello everyone, and welcome to this week's business building session. I'm Mike O'Neill, and I'm with Bench Builders, and I'll be your host today for this Q&A session. Joining us today as expert panelists is Sam Turnipseed. Sam is with First Citizens National Bank, and also with me again is my colleague, Rhonda Beard. Rhonda is going to be uh, sharing what we hope you'll find to be some important updates and give you some information that I think we hope you'll find helpful. Uh, just to kind of give you a little bit of idea of what we're doing and why we're doing this, we launched this session um, really to try to come together and figure out how we can learn from each other. The assumption here is that you're business owners, you're leaders, you're HR professionals, and we're trying to stay on top of the issues. What brought us together originally was in response to COVID. COVID hasn't gone away, but what we have done is kind of begin moving through of how do we move through COVID and come out stronger on the other end. And what we want to be able to position to do is through the expert panelists, through the things we talk about, hopefully offer some things that would help you build your businesses. Um, and looking at our attendees, it looks like about half of you um, are uh, new to uh, this webinar. So just to kind of let you know how we'll be doing what we're doing this morning. Um, two parts is what we're going to follow. Part one, we're going to hear from Sam Turnipseed, our expert panelist. And then on the back half, Rhonda Beard is going to be providing you some important updates. Just to remind you, you will be getting an email and that email will have a link to a recording of our time together. That email will also have a link to the slide deck that we're using, and it will include other information. So be looking for that email after our time together today. But what makes this work and makes us a little bit unique are the questions that you are asking. A number of you have already begun asking those questions. You know the format. Um, and so what I would invite you to do. If you got questions, go to the chat box, note those questions. Some of you know that you can ask those in advance by sending those to us, and so we anticipated those, and those are some of the things we're prepared to kind of address. So that's the plan for this morning, and I'd like to, at this point, uh, kind of move on to Sam um, and explain a little bit about why we invited Sam to be our expert panelist. Sam's a banker, I'm gonna have him introduce himself in, in a moment, but what really impressed me and my interactions with Sam is that he doesn't seem to ooze normal banker ways. Matter of fact, you can have a conversation with Sam for some time and not even know that he is a banker. And I heard loud and clear just in who he is, how important relationships are. And therefore we've invited him to join us today to kind of speak about the power of relationships. So Sam, it's good to have you with us today. Well, Mike, thank you very much. Um, you and Rhonda, it's, Rhonda, it's nice to meet you for the first time today. And Mike, over our last few weeks of conversations, it's just been really a joy. And it's, uh, you know, as we spoke about yesterday, um, we're always open to surround ourselves with good people. So I'm thankful to have been able to do that uh, with you. So. And uh, I do want to make one comment first. You said something about um, not oozing banker. I, 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 unfortunately, I know many bankers that, that ooze that way. And uh, so that, that's one of the things that, that I often let my customers know that I, I'm, I'm not a banker. I'm an entrepreneur that happens to work at a bank. Um, and uh, that's been the, my background. I was raised in, uh, on a farm in Alabama. My dad ended up... Uh, going into the real estate business. My mom was a nurse, so I kind of had a mix of the entrepreneur and employee uh, household, but uh, the entrepreneurism was always something I've been passionate about. So I started uh, several and still have a couple um, outside of the banking business. So uh, they're important to me and, and therefore small businesses have always been important to me and the opportunity to kind of work with them on the finance end, which has a tendency, I think, to plague a lot. Um, and I don't just mean the, the profit and loss and balance sheet aspect of running a small business, but understanding how to uh, garner and maintain good relationships with people who can provide you financing uh, and the different types of financing from investor to lending and so on and so forth. 
like it's sometimes it's a tough thing to navigate whether you're just getting started or uh, or you've been in the business for eight or ten years and you're just starting to have some larger credit needs I mean it's kind of it's kind of freaky sometimes so anyway it's been uh, it's been a blessing to be able to do that and I'm I'm thankful to hear you say that I don't use bank that just sounds terrible um, well, I know I just offended all my banker friends <laughs> by saying that hey do me a favor Sam it uh, we're hearing that your volume is not quite up, so I might get you to put the microphone a little closer to your mouth or turn up your volume on your end. Let me try this. Can you hear me? Can you hear me better now? Yeah, we have more of an echo there. I just uh, we're hearing that some uh, that folks have found the volume a little bit low. Okay. Um, I'll just uh, I'll move the microphone in my mouth a little bit more. Hang on, just one moment. Of course. All right, can you hear me okay now? Is it better? Yes. Now, can you talk with, with just one free hand? Uh, I don't. I don't know. My, <laughs> my hands are rather important to this whole scenario. <laughs> well, your hands are in the screen, so you can be assured of that. And okay, then let's good. go back to something you said a moment ago, and that is, you describe yourself kind of first as an entrepreneur who happens to be a banker. Yeah. Did I hear that right? Uh, you did. Um, and some of my entrepreneur friends have a tendency to laugh at that because you're like, well, if you're such a good entrepreneur, why are you still a baker? So that's a fair question. That is a fair question. <laughs> but uh, I do, uh, there are a couple of others uh, that are like me and probably many more that are better than me, but a couple of others that are like me in this industry that um, do feel like we are uniquely positioned in this industry, but also as conventional business owners, I own a small distribution company, uh, I own some commercial real estate. Like, so those are, it, it helps us to kind of really more identify with the everyday uh, needs and struggles that some of our, you know, our, our customers are, com are, are coming into uh, as well. I mean, for example, the idle loan and the PPP loan, well, those are things that we went through physically. Uh, we didn't just go through them as lenders. We went through them as business owners. So um, it, it, it provides us, I thought, with a, with a pretty unique perspective. And I also really don't, uh, subscribe to the whole idea of only having one source of income. I always thought it was wise to have multiple sources. So that's, that was the other motivation. I'm looking forward to exploring that a little bit here in a moment. Um, uh, Rhonda and I come from an HR background. We had an opportunity to work together in a corporate HR role. And we tended to kind of describe ourselves as that we are business people who happen to specialize in HR. And when you said, I am an entrepreneur who happens to be a banker, that kind of resonated with us. So that's in part why you're with us this morning. Um, you made an interesting comment, and that is you are a banker and you all are providing, you mentioned the PPP program. The PPP program, for those who are not familiar with the Paycheck Protection Program, was something that 12 weeks ago didn't even exist. And now, um, uh, most people have kind of heard of that, but you said something that was kind of unique, and that is you're helping your clients, your bank clients, not only from the perspective of a banker, but from a fellow business owner. Do you think that that is important when you're working with clients that you are literally able to walk in their shoes? Well, I, you know, I think so. Um, and, and we found that to be valuable. I mean, I can't speak for every one of my customers, but certainly since we went through that process ourselves, I personally did, and the application process and some of the rigors of that. Now, I went through that process long after I went through it as a banker. Um, you know, you mentioned it, that uh, the PPP program didn't exist 12 weeks ago, and I promise you, 11 weeks ago when it came on the scene, no banker wanted it to exist. It was a, it was a, uh, it was a wreck, to be honest with you, and. Um, uh, it has cleaned up now, and I can't really decide if it's cleaned up or if it kind of just became like uh, the splinter in your shoe that you just kind of get used to eventually. We don't know. We're not we're not sure yet, but um, but we have figured out a way to navigate that and make it a little more streamlined. And and of course, with the with the relief aspect of the PPP program that was just passed last Friday, uh, I think it's going to make forgiveness a lot easier. I I was a fan of the idea, uh, not to get political, so please don't misinterpret this. I'm not a real big fan of large government programs anyway, 
uh, just because, again, not to be political, I just, I'm very aware that the government's source of income is the Internal Revenue Service. And so anytime that they, that they create a large $2.2 trillion tr stimulus or anything, there will be a time of reckoning down the road. But, but that notwithstanding, I just feel like sometimes there's so many strings attached, particularly with the SBA, it just makes those things, things pretty nasty at some point. Um, so as we got deeper into PPP, we noticed those nasty things starting to rear their ugly head. But with that relief thing that was just passed last Friday, going from eight weeks uh, uh, to spend the money to 24 weeks, that gives more of a reasonable kind of time for people to ramp up their, um, their payroll. And if anyone's not familiar with what I'm talking about, you had the opportunity to get um, basically you took 10 weeks of your normal payroll expense from last year and you were given a loan for that amount and you had to spend it in eight weeks. 75% of that had to be on payroll and then 25% of it could be on other expenses. Well, we found that many people did not have the adequate staff because they were shut down due to the government, you know, due, due to COVID closures and whatnot. Well, they now just expanded that from eight weeks to spend that to 24 weeks to spend that, which really creates a lot, uh, a lot more flexible. And it just really, it's just a better thing. And now instead of spending 75% on your payroll, now they're allowing you to just spend 60. So um, there's been some great things. I do encourage anyone on here that has gotten a loan, a PPP loan from their lender, go back and make sure you're understanding the forgiveness process because it just got, in our opinion, uh, or in my opinion, I can't speak for everybody at First Citizens, but in my opinion, it just got a lot easier. Uh, that's helpful to know. Anything else you want to add on PPP before we move on to some of these other questions? Uh, I, I will tell you that we there were several different um, there, were, there were several different acronyms that we started throwing in for PPP, but I will I will leave those for an offline conversation. We started not liking them very much, <laughs> but we feel like they're going to end up being okay. All right, we're going to use our imagination of what that might very Knock well be. Knock yourself out. Knock yourself Thank out. Thank <laughs> you. I appreciate that. Uh, for those who are participating, um, Sam and I connected first at the recommendation of someone on LinkedIn. And rather than just say, hey, Sam, I'm glad we're connected, he and I had a conversation. And it was in that conversation that I kind of learned more about Sam, the person, versus Sam, the business person and I learned a little bit more about kind of what drives him and the conversation that we had centered around the criticality of relationships. Uh, many of the folks who have been, been participating in these Q&A sessions kind of fall into um, really two primary camps. They own businesses, they lead businesses, and or they also are in HR roles supporting these businesses. All those categories are very dependent on relationships because these relationships can be internal and external. It can be stakeholders. But one of the things that you kind of said here, and I want to kind of get you to clarify on that, and I just kind of put it verbatim um, as you shared it with that, and that is I wanted you to speak to something you said, and that is how important it is to cultivate long-term relationships with good operators in and out of your industry. Can we break that down for a moment? And that is, when you use the term good operator, what does that mean to you? Well, that is a, um, it, that is not as easy to define. And I'll, I, I do have some notes on this and I will go to it. But, you know, I don't think it has to be uh, articulated to be, uh, to be, to be duplicated. I mean, I, I don't think we're happy. We, you know, sometimes you can just see it. You know what I mean? And I, I say that, I know that sounds like a fat word or like I'm trying to avoid your question, but um, there is a certain um, uh, intangible or a it factor, I guess you can say, of good operators. I don't mean a charisma. I don't mean the ability to make you feel like you're, you're the most important person in the world. I mean, certainly there's aspects of people skills to that kind of stuff, but I mean, there are, um, the, the good operator is um, the only thing that I've found, and I haven't been through many downturns in the economy, I mean three. I went through the one in, in 01, I went through the one in 08, maybe four if you count the one in 13 a little bit, and then the one now. But I've just seen good operators figure things out. I mean, they don't have to predict the future to be able to thrive in it. And I think that that's really, really valuable. They, 
they're always thinking ahead. I, I've got, I've got some kind of tangible things that I've noticed uh, from good operators that I'll list here for you. And then I've got some intangible things and, and the intangible things in my opinion are, are, are more important um, as oftentimes they are, but um, you know, Jim Collins and uh, uh, Jerry Porras, if I'm saying that name, wrote a book called built to last and they just studied businesses that had lasted for however long. I think they studied 18 different businesses that had, that had been able to survive and thrive and continue to grow. And they found those, there's just a significant amount of characteristics in there that they denote about good operators. But just the ones that have kind of stuck out to me and what I've observed is, um, you know, they're on top of their financials. And I know that sounds boring, but I have a friend named Joe Livingston, who was a former accountant. I think he's like 106 years old, so he may have invented accounting. I'm not sure. <laughs> but, um, but he, uh, and I'll, I'll always pick on him about his age because he always picks on me about mine which doesn't even make sense because I'm 40 now, but, um, but he talks about a three-legged stool. You have your, your product that you sell or service that you offer. Uh, you have the marketing effort of that. And then you have your accounting. And if any one of those, if any one of those um, uh, legs of the stool doesn't, op doesn't, doesn't operate well, then you're going to fall. I mean, I'd venture to say, obviously with you guys being in the, in the human portion of business, you would, you would certainly say that there was probably a fourth leg of that, but one of those, Bottom line, if you don't, if you aren't good at accounting, it just really is a you're kind of flying by. Um, it is very much like the individual that doesn't live on a budget. I'm not trying to preach Dave Ramsey either, but I think people don't have money problems. They have mental problems and mental problems about money. And I find that in business uh, on a regular basis. So, um, so they're on top of their financials. Um, they watch and manage their consumer, their customer concentrations. Um, had a wonderful relationship with a company in Chattanooga very early in my career and 90% of their business came from one customer, but it had been their, their customer for 60 years. So like, what's the risk? Well, when a, when it passed to the set, when that other company passed to the second generation, they renegotiated all, all re renegotiated all their, uh, their contracts. And this, this company that had been around for 60 years with that customer went out of business. So it's, they, they're, they're, they're on top of their customer concentrations. They're, they watch their cash, they watch their debt, um, they watch their expenses. Uh, I can't tell you how embarrassed I was to do a, uh, to be involved in a transaction with a self storage facility that went out of business. I mean, how in the world does a self storage business go out of business? It's a metal box where people put their junk and they pay you. How does that go out of business? Well, when you don't collect and you do poor service, Every, there is no such thing as a surefire business. There is, however, such a surefire business that there's a good operator. So those are some of the tangible things. Then the intangibles, real quick, I'm also trying to be aware of how much I talk. And I am Baptist, so there's probably going to be an uh, altar call at the end of this. So just be ready. Three points in a poem and whatnot. Um, but uh, uh, the intangibles, which are the leadership skills, uh, they're humble in the way they seek knowledge. And by the way, that's not self-deprecating. They don't think they're stupid. They're just humble when they seek for information and seek, uh, seek knowledge. They invest in their people, yes, financially, but they also know them. Like they know their people and not just their inner circle. Like they just, uh, one, of, one of the entrepreneurs that I respect so very highly in town here, his name is Warren. Um, he knows, he's got 27 or 28 employees and they know him and he knows them. And that's not a very big company. Uh, he does a lot of revenue. It's not a very big company, but it's, he's, it's big enough and his customers are high profile enough that if he didn't know his people, it would almost be understandable that he knows his people. Um, they build relationships with their customers and, um, and, and they just, they just take care of them. And so I, I was, I sat down with a group of four young men the other day, they were wanting to start a business. And I just told them the, the thing that I truly believe that I've never met the multimillionaire that wasn't a good leader. Um, now I've met good leaders that weren't multimillionaires. I don't think that that's exclusive, but I've never met the multimillionaire and I understand it's not all about money, but let's be honest, capitalism, money equals the amount of service you provide. So we don't have, we, we don't have to like it, but that's how it is. Um, but I've never met the multimillionaire that wasn't a good leader. So I encourage these 19, 23 and two 24 year old young men to invest in themselves. That is one thing that I find an intangible that leaders do or that, that good operators do, excuse me, is they invest in themselves. It is so critical. Read stuff. Get around these good operators. 
talking about relationships, that's that's kind of the next step in this, Mike. I'm sorry it takes so long to answer that question. But that's Sam, I'm actually I'm making that, notes as you're speaking, so I don't forget some of these things. This is good stuff. Um, let me see if I am hearing you correctly, and that is um, you're defining a good operator. Um, if you use a different term for operator, but a good business person, uh, it could be an owner, it could be a leader, but a good person. One of the things you notice what defines them, though it's kind of intangible in some cases, is they stay on top of their numbers. And the numbers can mean a whole host of things. You mentioned their cash, their debt, their expenses. They also are looking at their numbers when it comes to metrics. What I think I heard you say is sales and product mix and margins. So they are adept to stay on top of the numbers. Did, did we hear that correctly? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good. Um, and you also said that good operators understand their customers. They understand them um, not, not just knowing who they are, but you, they also understand the customer. I used the word mix. You called it concentration. And right. that is um, you value long-term relationships, but you said, don't put all your eggs in too few baskets. That's right. Um, so they keep t kind of tabs on that. And of course, where I really sat up, and I think I noticed Rhonda doing the exact same thing, is when you start talking about what makes a good operator, it speaks to leadership. And you mentioned that uh, an effective leader who's willing to be humble. Um, um, and when you use the word humble, what does that mean to you? Well, I've... Um you know, we've, I'm sure we've all read culture books or we've read leadership books and it talks about the word humility and it's used. I mean, it, it, I just don't really think I can separate the word humility from leader because they understand that without a solid team, then they're not a solid leader. And so there's a lot of vulnerability there. I think that's super healthy and they just don't think they know anything. I mean, excuse me, they don't think they know everything. They know they know something. I mean, humility and confidence don't, don't, uh, don't contradict each other. Um, like they're confident in what they do know, um, but they just don't think they know everything. And um, I mean, that's not, that's attractive, but it's also like the only path I've ever seen to advancement. Well, if they don't know everybody or know everything, excuse me, then what that does is that kind of reinforces that next point. And that is they've got people on their team in their organization. And you made the comment that it's important that leaders invest in their people. Um, that could be employees, um, that could be invest in the customer relationships. Um, are, am I hearing that correctly? I, I, first of all, yes, but I, but in and out of, in and out, in or out of business, I've, I've, I've never met the leader that didn't invest in everybody around them in some way. They just invest. And I'm not trying to make this some sort of a leadership conversation strictly, but like, I just don't find leaders that don't consistently invest in everyone around them in some way, shape, or form. So when you use the term invest, as a banker, my, people might think that's just financial. What do you mean when you use the word invest? Um, so as, as a, and I, I guess because my first bend is entrepreneur and my second is banker, I don't really think banker first, which I'm, and maybe, maybe I shouldn't let my boss hear this, um, but, but um but, but I, bankers don't invest, by the way. I mean, the actual, uh, the actual th um, act of banking, um, we are not investors. We expect to have our money back. We don't want equity, right? So we want, we want money plus interest. We do not want equity. If you have an investor that comes in, there's no necessarily a structured repayment thing. They want 10% of your business or 20% of your business. So that's, that's a, from a financial standpoint, strictly, investing is different than banking. Oftentimes people want bankers to be investors because they want you to lend a hundred percent of this particular project, but bankers will not be the only ones with skin in the game. That's why they, you know, they have the risk metrics and all that sort of stuff, not to get all too far down the rabbit hole on that, but bankers are not investors. So if you ever get frustrated at your banker, understand, uh, feel free to get frustrated at them. I mean, we, we, we are oftentimes the ones who are uh, we earn a lot of that frustration. So I'm not telling you it's unwarranted. Um, but, um, but just understand they are uh, bankers, not, not investors. But what I was speaking about particularly there, Mike, was that they are, whether it be a um, stopping to ask a sincere question, um, 
uh, and I'm talking about surface relationships, um, people that you meet. I mean, one of the, one of the mentors that I have, we were um, we were actually staying in a hotel in the same hotel, and I I walked out of my room to see him having a conversation with the person who was cleaning his room, and it wasn't hey will you clean it better? It was hey where are you from? Like it was a it just was something that was remarkable to me, and it has stuck with me now all these years. He he it's not that he's never met a stranger. He loves strangers. And I just found that was something that was really interesting that he invested in. And by the way, the majority of my customers today, um, some come from a, a BNI group that I'm in, but the majority of my new customers come from people that I meet at Target or at a gas station or at Home Depot. It's random, but I like talking to people. And so I learned that from great leaders who are always investing in people. So the bullet we listed here, Sam, is um, the importance of cultivating relationships, particularly long-term relationships. Um, what guidance would you have for us on ways to cultivate relationships? Well, you got to be interested in what they're talking about. I mean, not, not to sound like the Captain Obvious statement the other day, but if you go in and try to pitch, you're not building a relationship. You're trying to get a sale. And I don't have a sales process. I have a relationship process. Um, and I mean, now, if you looked at it on paper, it would probably be called a sales process. But, um, but you got to be interested in what they're talking about. Um, I think one of the things that I've enjoyed about this industry and being in this role is you learn so much, you learn so much, but it's like a 16 year old with a 16 year old boy with his car. He wants to talk about that. It's something he's proud of. That's how business owners are for the most part. They want to talk about their business. So I think the first step in this is ask genuine questions. Don't sound genuine, be genuine, like ask a question and find out the answer. And don't wait for someone else to shut up for you to talk next. That's the one thing I did early in my career. And I was wondering why I kept running into brick walls. I wasn't listening. I was waiting for them to shut up for a second so I could talk. And uh, so the first thing is just find out what they're interested in. I mean, you got to find them first. But, I also, but I've also found that you can find them by walking up and down the street. I mean, I'm not a door-to-door -door salesperson, but I like going into places that I think are cool. And I'll ask them, dude, this place is cool. Like, how'd you do it? And they like to tell me. I mean... The Warren Brandon, the gentleman I was talking about, who I have been calling on now for seven years without a piece of business. He is one of my closer friends now. And I met him uh, by walking into his office and saying, this is cool. And I will do business with him. We're working on an acquisition right this minute. I will do business with him. But it doesn't matter. He's my friend. And he sent me other business, by the way. But it's just, I found out what he was interested in. Um, and don't always be selling. That's the second thing. Number one, be genuinely interested in what they're saying. And number two, don't always be selling. Um, when the relationship is right, the transaction will follow. You know, I asked, how do you cultivate? And your response was, you just basically go interact with people who you come in contact. If I heard you correctly, Sam, you kind of said you, that genuineness comes through loud and clear. Be genuine in getting to know them. Admittedly, you have a livelihood, you have family to support, you have things that you have to do to support them. But what I understood you to say is that if you start selling them, that tends to turn them off and that you focus your energy on the relationship. Um, we have folks on this webinar who are in a sales capacity. We have folks on this webinar who are um, I have internal customers. We've got a number of HR folks where our internal customers might be employees, it might be management, it might be the C-suite. But to some extent, we're selling our services. So I'm hoping people are hearing that the kinds of things you're sharing, Sam, can apply to all of us, regardless of our role. Um, you did intrigue me, and that is you made reference to that you want to cultivate relationships with an eye towards the long term, and you want to cultivate those long term relationships with people who are on top of their game. They're good operators. They watch their numbers. Uh, they pay attention to the customer mix. They're willing to invest in others and invest in themselves. But you add this in and out of your industry. What does that mean? Oftentimes, um, I can only, the only reason I brought, I said that. Um, initially, Mike, when we talked about it a week or so ago, um, is because I feel like sometimes bankers get to a point where the only thing they do is talk to other bankers. I mean, they're, they're talking to their customers about terms and payments and yada, 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 but they don't really start, they don't, they don't, they don't try to learn a lot. 
And I've, I've seen that in people in the real estate industry. They don't talk to manufacturers and people in the manufacturing industry. They don't talk to people in distribution. And, and I'm, I'm saying all that to say there are incredible operators that are in all sorts of industries. I mean, like clearly or else we wouldn't have a stable, not today withstanding, a, a stable growing economy, right? So there's, there's good operators everywhere and you can learn from all of them. And, and you really just don't ever know where a relationship can go. Mike and I talked about this yesterday about kind of our relationship and our friendship is growing. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think you ever waste time in a relationship. And I know people can say, oh, you don't have any idea about this one person. Well, did you learn from that? So it wasn't a waste. I mean, you know, if you're going to lose, don't lose the lesson, right? So uh, I, I have, I'm, I'm making a point, and I learned this from a mentor. I make it a point to go find people outside of even my ability to lend. If I can, even if I can't do business with them, I want to learn how they're doing things because you can pick up little things. Again, it doesn't have to be articulated to be duplicated. I mean, you can see it and internalize it, and you know, you, you see that example, and then you can therefore lead by example. Um, I just, um, I mean, articulation helps, by the way. It's always good to be able to have some, have notes or have something you can you know, go back and, and refer to. But man, there is a, um, that it factor is contagious. And sometimes somebody in my industry that I have, pre that I'm privy to may not have that that I'm looking for. So I just think it's important to widen your base of connections all the time. Sam, as I'm listening to you, um, I'd like to ask if you could stick with us. Um, I want to move to Rhonda here in just a moment, but some of the things that she's prepared to speak on, I think it's going to dovetail very nicely with some things you've already said, and you didn't really know what she was going to say. Um, so if you're willing to stick with us, I'd like to, when Rhonda's through, kind of go back to kind of a Q&A between you and, and Rhonda. Um, so can we hold on to you for a little bit longer? I'd be glad to. Thank you, sir. You bet. Um, Rhonda, something that, that just kind of got um, uh, released um, in Tennessee, that is, um, is the, a, a relief act specific to Tennessee. And we wanted for those on this webinar who are in Tennessee to give them a, a quick update on what is available to them. Can you cover that first? Sure, I just wanted to go through this quickly because it is fairly new and many of you might already know it, but for those who don't, uh, just to be aware that there's $200 million in the state of Tennessee that have been allocated from the relief fund that the state got that's going towards small businesses in Tennessee. So more than 28,000 small businesses are going to qualify for some funding through this uh, relief program. And this was just, this just came out last week. And basically to qualify, the business had to have incurred costs due to a mandatory government Clo business closure. So businesses that voluntarily closed are not going to be part of this, but if the government issued a mandatory closure order on your business, and this would be for places like, you know, salons and, and um, barbershops and dental offices and many small businesses that were ordered to close, those are the businesses that are going to qualify for this. And there is no application needed. Uh, the business or the, excuse me, the Department of Revenue system is looking at businesses that are registered either for sales tax or business tax return purposes, and that's where they're going to be getting the information. So if businesses are not part of that Department of Revenue system, they're not going to qualify. And we'll include a little bit more information in the follow-up materials that we send out, but just want to make sure that small businesses in Tennessee know that there's some additional relief coming for those that really suffered losses due to mandatory closure orders. Uh, that's helpful. So for those who will be looking for the email follow-up, we're going to go add uh, to this slide deck uh, contact information, website information, so that if you want to pursue this relief program, you can just do it right off that information. Thank you, Rhonda. Um, one of the things that um, we are finding is the, the economy. Um, who knows what it's going to do, but one of the things we've been watching very closely week in and week out has been the unemployment rate. Uh, they just released the latest numbers. Um, the, the numbers um, are slightly down. Um, uh, uh, 1.5 million people in the United States filed for unemployment 
uh, last week. That brings the total to just slightly over 20 million, uh, which is also down. It means that for the last 10 weeks, the trend continues to be down. It doesn't mean that we're out of the the woods yet, but what it's meaning is that organizations are attempting to get back into what is it they were doing. And what that has done is it's kind of highlighted um, a lot of challenges because we had to, as business owners, as leaders, as HR professionals, we've been in scramble mode for much of the last three, pushing now four months. Now we're hearing from our clients that there is a focus now on what do we have to do kind of going forward. One of the things we have found that a lot of organizations had to quickly had to adopt to employees who are working remotely. So Rhonda, is that what you mean by a blended team? Yeah, so when we talk about what leader skills are needed, and certainly leadership skills are something that many companies are constantly investing in, because your leaders really make your work culture. Your leaders are the ones that have the biggest impact on your work environment, on employee engagement, on employee retention. And so investing and continually training and upgrading the skills of your leaders is always important. But right now, what's important is to know that there may be different skills needed as our work environments are changing. And to just kind of you know, throw people back into the work site and say, okay, now we've got all these changes that have happened. So, you know, go back to, go back to your, your leading like you used to do. It's different now. So blended team, what we mean is many leaders have some people on site and they have some people working remote or maybe their whole team is working remote right now. And that's something that a lot of people haven't been used to and haven't maybe been excited about but we've been thrown into it. And we've talked about this on several other websites, or excuse me, webinars before about being thrown into something that we really had no plan for and some things that you can do to manage that better. But we really need to make sure our leaders know and have the skills and know how to manage different people in different locations, whether they're in front of them or whether they're in multiple different sites, but things like communicating clear expectations how do you do that when you have people working in different environments? And a lot of sales managers, for instance, are used to managing remote people, and they've done that for a number of years. So there's sometimes some things we can learn from individuals like that, but making sure to understand what scenario you have in front of you and how to manage people in that scenario differently maybe than what you have in the past. And it, it is different, and it's going to continue to be different. So Rhonda, you've described that leaders now need to be more comfortable in leading people that might not be in your immediate physical presence. They may be working remote part-time or full-time. And so what you're stressing is the importance of having the skill to effectively manage teams, be it in-person or remote or perhaps blended. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we have have had almost as a recurring theme throughout all of these Q&A sessions is the challenge of communication, particularly communication when it's kind of almost in kind of a crisis mode, which we found ourselves not that long ago. But from a communication standpoint, um, it's hard to summarize to a few bullets what it is that we're trying to stress. But if you were to make a stab at this, you listed some things here to kind of get this conversation started. Can you elaborate on the bullets that you suggested? Sure. And as you said, Mike, it kind of dovetails nicely into some things that Sam was saying about building relationships, because you want to have relationships with your employees as well. The better relationship you have with people who work for you, the more they're going to trust you. So the more authentic and transparent you are, we've, you know, we've talked in previous sessions about being open and honest and sharing as much information as you can with people during these changes. And the more you share with them and the more you talk to them, the more they're going to trust you as a leader. And if people trust you, they're going to share more with you as well, which will help it easier, make it easier for you to lead and develop a strong team. So when you're 
discussing things with employees, again, right now, really need to understand their personal situation. There's a lot going on in our environment right now. And we're going to talk next week a little bit more about working with a more diverse workforce and how to handle, you know, diverse workforces with all the different things going on in our communities right now. But listening, making sure you're, you're really listening and understanding what your employees may be experiencing, not just, you know, problems they have at work, but problems they have at home. And many times in the past, in, in my past years, you know, managers want to say to employees, leave your personal problems at the door. Well, that doesn't, it doesn't happen. Um, people are experiencing personal things all the time right now, and you can't leave it at the door. They're going to come into work. They're going to be on their mind. They're going to have distractions. And the best thing that we can do as leaders is not just tell them to leave it at the door, but to help them with those distractions and with some things that they might be experiencing. So really listening and understanding what your people are going through. And again, that's going to be different between people that are in front of you that you're leading versus people in different locations. So knowing that there's a lot of things right now that are distractions to people and the way you communicate with them and how much you communicate with them can really make a difference in how, how the relationship goes with those individuals. And it's a lot of work. It takes a lot of time, but it's going to pay off in how well your team supports you and performs for you and your company if you really take the time to listen and communicate and share and let them know that you care about them. Uh, excellent. Let me remind the folks who are participating, if you have a question, go to the chat box and just click, do you want to ask a panelist? And um, I'm monitoring that and what we'll try to do is get your questions answered. That's what makes this work and work very, very well. Um, I have heard this term empathy, Rhonda, and I've heard it used correctly and incorrectly as I have defined it. But when you have this word empathy, what does that mean to you? How do you define empathy? Well, I think empathy is being able to put yourself in someone else's shoes and understand their situation as best possible. You know, to say to somebody, I understand what you're going through really isn't accurate unless you have been through exactly what they've been through. But having empathy and empathizing with them is trying to put yourself in their spot and trying to imagine and um, understand what it is that they're telling you and what they're going through. And, and again, just showing that you care, showing that you care and you want to help them. Um, but putting yourself in their shoes is one way to really kind of break down some barriers that you might have when someone might be in a situation that you don't know, you don't understand, um, maybe you don't think is as critical as they think it is, but, but mainly just showing that you care, showing that um, you do care about what they're going through and you want to help them. Rhonda, you made a comment and I want to just make sure that um, I don't forget to mention this. We are acknowledging that we're not working uh, in a bubble here. Uh, in the last 90 to 120 days, um, our world has seen um, just total upheaval. Uh, what started with a pandemic as a health emergency has morphed into now an economic emergency uh, that has drugged much of the world's economies into literally a recession. Um, of late, there has been uh, another form of emergency, and that is um, unrest that's resulted in protesting in the streets with a real emphasis on um, a sense of uh, what's fair, particularly when we're talking about race and race relations and how um, the police are interacting and, and enforcing those things. We choose not to get political in these Q&A sessions, but as employers, we have to be mindful of that this is what's going on in the real world. This has worked its way into that bubble. Um, and so we're going to be spending some time next week kind of building that out a little bit. And we had already mentioned that we're going to talk a little about technology, but we've already lined up our webinar expert for the following week. And um, we've asked Kevin to speak on the topic of Zoom meetings as leaders. 
how can you effectively use Zoom so that it, it doesn't compromise the quality of, uh, of a meeting? Um, and so in terms of other things you want to cover before I would move back to Sam and we do a little Q&A between the two of y'all, anything else you want to add that you wanted to cover, Rhonda? Yeah, I'll just, and I will just mention briefly, because we are going to cover those two, as you said, in future weeks, but your technology skills, again, a lot of people may have not had real strong technology skills, but if you have people working remote or you're having to communicate virtually like this, you need to make sure you understand the technology you have, how to use it effectively, make sure your people have the right technology. So that's a new element, again, that a lot of people have been thrown into having to manage that they didn't have to before. So it's just making sure that your leaders have the training, the skills, and the tools that they need. And then as far as, you know, there's so much built into the crisis management, but there, there definitely is a skill to dealing with that and how you deal with crisis. And as you said, Mike, we have multiple crises facing people right now between, you know, a lot of the, the, the weather crisis in various locations, you know, in the areas that we're in right after COVID hit, we had tornadoes. Now you've got tropical storms hitting and that affects people. That affects your workplace, that affects their personal situations. Um, you have people with financial issues, health issues, you know, possibly accommodation issues, um, and it's gonna affect their mental well-being and stability and the way that they're they're productive or non-productive at work. So knowing how to address those things effectively with people and how to manage those crises when they come up um, it is a skill and being able to change and pivot, you know, change management is another one we don't really mention here, but so many businesses have been through so much change in the last several months that was never anticipated. So how do you maneuver through and manage those changes in your business as well as with your employees is also another, again, skill that your leaders are having to deal with that might not have anticipated that a few months ago. So again, just to reiterate that there's a lot of skills that leaders now need that they may have not needed three months ago and will continue. It's not, as we've said before, this is not a, we need to do this now and it's going to go back to the way it was in a couple months. Nobody really anticipates that happening. So it is needing to figure out how to lead differently and what skills your leaders might need help with. And we, you know, Bench Builders has a whole series of management training that we can help with materials, virtual training, in-person training on these topics and lots of other management topics. And so obviously we're here to help you with that if there's training that you need to do with your managers. And we don't wanna lose sight of training and investing in people so that their careers are accelerating and they're successful as well. And, and I think a lot of it's been put on the back burner through this, but I just encourage people to really take a look at what your leaders need to be successful as we go through a lot of these changes. That's very good. Thank you, Rhonda. Sam, I want to come back to you for a moment. You stressed the value of really listening to those you come in contact with. That's particularly true with customers. I was watching you while Rhonda was speaking, listening and listening attentively. What did you hear Rhonda say that resonated with you that complements what you may have already said? Well, first of all, Rhonda, it was good to hear from you. I and mean, this is the first time I've had a chance to, uh, to hear kind of from your, your brain and your heart, and both of which are completely aligned from my perspective. So it was awesome. Thank you for that. Um, you know, the whole idea of listening, you know, what is, what's the, I wish I could remember who wrote this. I don't know if it was a Covey, if it was a Covey habit or not, but seek first to understand, then to be understood. That is Stephen um, Covey. Okay. All right. I just, um, man, I, I have learned so much in the last two weeks by talking to friends of mine, friends of ours, uh, both customers and just friends uh, in the black community and understanding kind of where their thoughts are and how that affects, to Rhonda's point, how that affects um, them as leaders. I mean, there are minority business owners that I'm proud to call my customers and to see um, how they've had to maintain the focus on their business and also really wrestle with a lot of things going on with 
not only their employees, but also uh, the entire society has been, has been quite a learning experience. Um, so I think, um, I think, you know, we all have certain uh, belief systems and we all have certain thought processes that are rather ingrained in our mind. Um, but I don't think, um, I don't think because you're strong that you have to be stubborn. I think if you add wisdom to strength, um, then you can really, really uh, not only endear a lot of people to you, because it's not a popularity contest, but you can truly lead people uh, and ultimately lead yourself to that next level. That goes back to the humility thing that, that you guys were talking about, I, or that we were all talking about. Um, I mean, you, if you, you, you take humility out of authenticity and it's fake, I mean, it's not authentic. It's just, it's, it's fake. So, and, and people know fake, they can smell it a mile away. And um, I think it's, um, that's just what I heard about just really being able to understand you don't have all the answers. And, you know, I think the good leader learns as much from his people as they learn from him or her. Sam, I appreciate your comments. It sounds to some extent you're reading out of some of our training materials. Um, and you said something to the effect, they can tell if you're sincere, they can tell if you're faking it. Rhonda, do you agree? Can the oh. can employees tell if you're faking it? You're trying to be empathic, but can they tell if you're not? Sure, of course. And in fact, we you know we talked a little bit about this on a webinar we did earlier this week with another group, and uh, how important really truly listening is. So, when you talk about communication, what a lot of people think about when you say communication is doing presentations and talking to people, but the most important part of communication is listening. And we, you know, we did discuss a number of skills to really emphasize your listening skills and show people you are listening. So, you know, giving them your attention, removing distractions, making sure that you're focusing on them as the most important person in the room. And today that might be the most important person on your computer screen. <laughs> and uh, so listening, extremely important. And yeah, people can tell if you're not, you're going to be distracted or, you know, not um, giving them the time that they need. So people get busy, taking time to listen to people sometimes is a distraction in your day. But again, something Sam said earlier that helps build those relationships and those relationships can be long lasting and very impactful in your friendships, in your personal life, in your business life. So really taking time to listen to people is, is a skill um, and shows how much you care about them and will benefit you and them in the long term if you will just take the time and really focus on it. Hmm. Thank you, Rhonda. Hey, Sam, I want to go back to uh, something that we did not get a chance to cover um, on a uh, previous slide, and that is um, you made this comment about the value of internal partnerships, and I failed to ask you about that. What do you mean by internal partnerships? Um, the, I, I will say, first of all, I'm, um, I, I want to be quick on this because I want to be respectful of everybody's, about everybody's time, but this probably is the hot button for me and my and my not just my professional life, but also my personal life right now is understanding how valuable uh, your team is. Now, when I say your team, I, I'm not a leader at the bank. I mean, I have, a, I have a vice president title, but like out of 280 employees, I think there's 100 vice presidents. I mean, it's really not a big deal. It's like <laughs> saying, congratulations, here's a title. You know, it doesn't mean anything. I mean, I'm sure it means something to somebody else. I just don't think it's about it. But I'm saying that to say I'm not, I don't have direct reports. I have no direct reports. I have an assistant, but she doesn't even report to me. In fact, it's probably a good thing. She'd be better off not to report to me. But, <laughs> but my, my point in that is um, the, the people that we touch in our daily, in our daily lives, from, from, from me, for example, my underwriter, my appraisal department, my doc processor, like the, the people, and everybody has this in their, in their job or their world. But those relationships, I believe, are, are a higher, have a higher percentage uh, reason for my success at this bank than my external customers. Now, I love my external customers, don't misunderstand me. Um, but I, I have really been trying to process why we have been able to do what we've been able to do here at this bank that no one else has been able to do in a short period of time. And I really think it has to do with investing 
And I don't mean, again, they don't report to me, but I want to get people that are on my team to do things because they want to do them, not because they have to do them. And you can really tell that if they don't report to you, right? So we, I, we're building, and in, fa- in fact, a friend of mine and I are kind of working on this to try to try to develop it, is trying to develop this thing that we're not asking for favors anymore. We're looking for favor. Like we're trying to build relationships to a point where I don't have to ask for favors. I don't want to ask for favors because that's me making a withdrawal before I make a deposit. I don't want to do that. So I want to build it to where I am doing things for them without them having to ask. And they are doing things for me because they don't have to ask because we are not coworkers. We are partners, regardless of who we report to. So it's something that's really, I'm really passionate about where I literally think about it and write about it about two hours a night. Like it's something that I feel like I just, nobody in the banking industry is talking about it right now. And it's something that's important to me. Sam, you just effectively demonstrated one of the points that you made earlier, and that is the importance of humility. And you showed considerable humility by just calling it like it is. Um, You also are given credit to the people who are making it work for you. And you're acknowledging that importance of the coworkers that that you've kind of come in contact with. I cannot believe that we are out of time, but we we essentially are. And therefore I would like if I could just very quickly um, to kind of cue up what's next. Um, uh, we've invited, uh, many of y'all perhaps know Beverly German. She's in Chattanooga. She seems to know everybody, but what makes her going to be a great expert panelist, um, is that she has, um, some insights on what is it we're going to have to be doing, not immediately as these folks return to work to honor social distancing, but acknowledging that the workplace as we know has forever changed. And what do we have to do as owners, as leaders, as HR professionals to modify our workplaces accordingly? I also want to remind the folks who are on this call today, if we have surfaced something that you would like to explore further, you have questions that you might not felt comfortable asking and putting in the chat box, we want to make you aware that Rhonda or I are happy to speak with you to try to address the questions you may have. And in the follow-up email, you will have a link such that you can literally click it and get get on our calendars. And we're happy to do that on a a no charge basis. Um, If you like what you heard from Sam, here's Sam's contact information, um, his email and uh, the website to his his bank Um, and I just sit here and enjoyed listening to both of you. Sam, as expected, it was just really nice to hear you speak, not just from the head, but perhaps much more importantly from the heart. And you gave us perspective of probably why you are as effective as you are, who happens to be a banker, but you've put the emphasis on relationships, the emphasis on humility, emphasis on uh, the, the value of the relationship short-term and long-term. Rhonda, as always, I enjoy working with you on, on this. So on behalf of Bench Builders, I want to thank you for giving us an hour of your time again this week. We're flattered by it, and we hope you will be able to join us this time next week. Until then, be safe. God bless. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you, Mike. And Rhonda.